Uh, welcome to the Sea Art Festival 2021 um, keynote lecture. Uh, we're with Estrida de Manes. Um, thank you, Estrida, for being here. Um, Estrida is a leading figure in the field of hydrofeminist thought and cultural theory. Her expansive work on liquid assemblages of being multi-species care and intersectional justice, as well as corporeal weatherings, have influenced and been in dialogue with a wide range of scholars, researchers, artists, environmental and scientific practitioners, institutions, and communities. Um, her most recent book, Bodies of Water, has become a fundamental text in um, environmental literature. It's also been a text that's been a source of much resonance and um, constructive friction within my own thinking, particularly in formulating the concept for the Sea Art Festival this year um, and the concept of non-human assemblages. Estrida recently joined the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, on unceded silk and Okanagan lands in Kelowna, BC, Canada, as Associate Professor of Community, Culture and Global Studies. Her work has been featured in many artistic realms, most recently shaping the 2021 Shanghai Biennale. Her lecture today, entitled Care for the Stranded, is an elegiac call to care for human and non-human bodies stranded on watery shores. A deeply poetic and critical reflection on death and forms of nurture, this dog draws from an ongoing project with artist Patty Chan and wildlife pathologist Alexia Neymanis. Um, welcome, Ms. Trita. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ditika. I am very grateful to be here and speaking to you from the unceded Silk Okanagan lands where I now live as an uninvited guest. So, my talk today is called care for the stranded. Prologue, 12th of May, 2021, 3.02 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Little girl. You are running your hand smoothly along the skin, moving from the head down the animal. You are feeling for net marks, bycatch, female, found in the beginning of March. Not emaciated, possibly poor condition, no other abnormalities. Fingers pressing into flensed side belly. Traffic is waking up outside. I could see the faint sparkle of the Big Dipper. 3.46 a.m. Scoring the blubber, stacking it up. Someone is taking it from the table. Now I'm with you. I'm at the mammary gland. It looks pretty inactive. I tried to express milk, but there was nothing there. There's a little bit of hemorrhage, base of the skull, back of the neck. Likely when the animal was caught in the neck, in the net, and was struggling. Remove the apaxial muscle. Now I'm going to open the abdomen carefully. It is a little girl with immature ovaries, which I'm going to remove. 4.07 a.m. I'm using a new scalpel. You probably can't see me here. I'm just out of the field of vision. I'm slicing through the pancreas, removing the tongue, then trachea, just popping out the epiglottis so I can remove the rest, the lung and the heart underneath it, the uterus, the ovaries, and the bladder underneath, 4.51 a.m. Examine the respiratory tract. Uh, my daughter's calling. Hello? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yatibara, hey, hey. Okay, liver. It's actually really beautiful, firm texture, color as it should be. It is almost completely light. The birds outside getting louder. 5.17 a.m. The body is open like a mouth. We're getting closer to the end here. No other overt pathology. That's it, and the table looks clean. That's it for today and for me. 6.23 a.m. Part one, when death is all around. We live in a time of almost unfathomable loss and we are called to respond. We are called to respond to that which we cannot fully understand and we are called to understand why and how we are called. These words begin an essay by anthropologist and field philosopher Deborah Bird Rose, written almost a decade ago called In the Shadow of All This Death. 
Rose was a leading figure in the field of environmental humanities. Her later work in particular was interested in questions of death and extinction and how these phenomena reshape worlds. Debbie died a handful of years ago, too early from cancer. Lately, I find myself returning to this work. There is so much death around us. In a time of COVID-19 and accelerating climate catastrophe, this presents not only as the death of individual beings, but also as the end of species, as the end of a way of life, the end of possibilities and the end of relations. As Rose suggested, even though death must be an important part of life, death is sometimes not only death, but double death. In this sixth great extinction, which cannot be understood as separate from capitalism, colonialism, militarism, heteropatriarchy, and other forms of violence, not only do individuals die, but their entanglement in other beings' ways of life dies too. Patterns of embodied connection wither and shrink. As you will no doubt know, many marine mammals are also among the many species currently dying. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises, also known as cetaceans, breathe air like you and me. They give birth to live young and take considerable time preparing those young for life on their own, like you and me. Cetaceans are highly intelligent with complex social lives. Although their ancestors were once land-dwelling mammals, some four million years ago, those animals forsook terrestriality for a more watery existence. While some cetaceans made an admirable comeback after the decimation caused by large-scale whaling industries, they are now imperiled anew by noise, hunger, garbage, traffic, and heat. Double death is thus also caught in the ocean's currents, but this double death at sea is mostly occurring beyond our field of vision. So how are we to respond? This talk draws on pilot project research I've undertaken with artist Patty Chang and wildlife pathologist Alexia Namanis, who leads a marine mammal disease surveillance program at the National Veterinary Institute of Sweden. This project has also had important inputs from our collaborators, Jamie Wang, Sue Reed, Tara Nicholson, and a number of scientists and activists who have generously given their time to speak to us, including Dr. Brian Cott at the City University in Hong Kong. This research concerned stranded cetaceans. On the frayed edges of the watery habitat they call home, these stranded animals join many other beings, human and non-human, that in these troubled times have taken their leave among strangers, removed from their own families and homes. These strangers are then called upon to respond. In the case of stranded marine mammals, some scientists respond with the Western scientific practice of necropsy, that is the post-mortem examination of an animal in order to try to understand its death. These scientists are afforded a rare opportunity for a kind of intimacy with these animals. This talk thus invites you to understand this practice as a complex form of care and as one kind of response to the stranded under conditions of climate catastrophe. More broadly, this talk invites you to think about those who are stranded in these troubled times and to consider who cares for the stranded, but also who cares for those who care. Part two, who cares science as a form of care. Western science has a lot to answer for. Fallacies of objectivity, excessive extraction, fraught intimacies with colonialism and capitalism and other charges animate calls for accountability. Yet those of us committed to feminist, anti-racist, decolonial and queer approaches to environmental urgency might feel ambivalent in advancing these critiques too strongly. We want to question certain premises, but we also recognize the urgent value of much scientific research. This tension is even more palpable in this so-called 
post-truth era, where critique can be easily conflated with denials of all kinds, propped up by an absurdist knowledge scape where to say something, anything, loudly and brazenly enough, can apparently make it true. So this presents as a bit of a baby in bathwater problem. No science is innocent or value free of that we can be sure. But where does that leave us? It leaves me, for one, curious. A curiosity I brought to this project. Alongside more extensive research and interviews with aquatic animal pathologists and biologists, our pilot project centered on the observation of live streamed porpoise necropsies conducted by Alexia in her lab in Uppsala, Sweden, and watched by Patty and me from our respective homes in North America. We were curious, what might these observations teach us about science, scientists, and care for the stranded? So let's begin again in the necropsy room. 12.48 a.m. PST. Liver, unremarkable, no parasites. Stomachs, only four stomach opened, mostly empty, except three to five mils, digestive slurry, no parasites. Kidneys, unremarkable. Spleen, unremarkable. Adrenals, possibly mildly atrophic. Cortex, histo, bladder, small, unremarkable. Repetition, precision, patience. A necropsy can take half a workday or longer, which does not include the preparatory labors nor the distribution and disposal of the remains. About three hours into the first live stream, I write in my notes, I don't think there is anything I do that requires this many hours of uninterrupted attention to something or someone else. We talk a lot about the importance of protocol. Three slices, one dorsal 18, one lateral 17, one ventral 21, two dorsal 17, two lateral 17, two ventral 20, three dorsal 16, three lateral 17, three ventral 17, four dorsal 19, four lateral 15, and there's nothing. 3.13 a.m. To an outsider, the practice appears coldly surgical, but we learn that it is a deeply sensual affair. I go a lot by feel to tell where I'm supposed to be cutting, you tell us. Other scientists we speak to talk about the smell. You can tell which species you will be attending by the scent of the room when you enter, one tells us. Another mentions how in comparison to porpoises and seals, the whale she sampled smelled very different. Darker was the word she used. All of the scientists we talk to repeat the importance of staying attuned to the animal as a question of respect. When I hesitatingly asked you about adopting an objectifying stance toward the animal, you were taken aback and annoyed. I don't do this for me, you said. Everything that a body accumulates needs to be accounted for. We do this for the animal. This is for the animal and the ones that come before and the ones that come after. So words are tricky. We later spoke about the possibility of untethering objectification from mastery. Part three, witnessing necropsy. Everything is so rotten, it might be an exercise in futility because the rest of the uterus is missing, opening here. Everything has been washed away. The diameter of the, I don't know if you can see this, the diameter of the uterus of the cervix indicates she's been pregnant before. So yeah, external bits of bitten off. This whole thing has been contaminated. Okay, okay, there's nothing more I can do here. As always, Patty and I are watching through the portals of our laptops. We are hovering in the corner of your screen, which we know is placed on a small trolley that attends you as you attend to this animal thousands of miles away from us. 
because of the time differences for Patty and me, it's the middle of the night. This rented townhouse is dark and quiet. As you proceed through your protocols, the birds outside are getting louder. Soon the traffic does too, and all of a sudden the sky is lit up. My kids come downstairs for breakfast. Although this animal was already severely decomposed, with many parts of it already scavenged, the necropsy went ahead anyways. There's nothing more I can do here, you said, but I'll do it just to say that I did. During these sessions, you recite a running commentary out loud. At first, Patty and I asked a lot of questions, but now we're mostly silent. I keep myself awake by taking freeform notes, usually 20 or more pages per session. I don't quite know why, but it feels urgent to write down everything. This ambit soon gives way to an aching wrist. It is impossible to hold it all. Any photography or recordings of the necropsy room or the animal are not permitted. So instead, I watch Patty watching you. Her hair is glossy black, her facial expressions an index of what is happening on the table. I often get absorbed in the rhythm of the note taking, focused on your voice, my head stays down for two or three minutes. I'm surprised to look back up at the screen and find the stainless steel table is mostly empty. The animal components already removed, a blue gloved hand hosing it down. These animals are so elusive. Your voice is still steady, methodically working your way through your notes. Porpoise, previously frozen, parts of body, female, adult, cannot determine body condition, severely autolyzed, sitting in the fridge so long, suspected by catch, but undetermined. 2.21 a.m. As part of the project, Jamie interviewed several scientists about the emotional dimensions of this work. One barely hesitated in her response. When you look at the stomach contents, she said, it brings you back to the mundane life of the animal. You can often see what they were doing and where they were swimming right before death. I go over my notes from the first necropsy I watched. It was nighttime for me, but mid-afternoon for you. Your daughter called you on your cell phone. I can't talk right now, you told her. I'm doing a necropsy. You carefully checked the organs of the porpoise for parasites. You made notes. This was a juvenile, male, good nutritional condition. Not yet weaned. The animal's stomach still contained its mother's milk. Deborah Bird Rose writes that in living with the dying of others, quote, we bear the burden of witness. But more than that, writes Rose, the ethical burden is a question of, quote, how we inhabit the death zone, how we call out, how we refuse to abandon others. Against this vortex of death, she asks, what does one have to offer? Double death, writes Rose, also doubles back to claim us too. Even when the dead are not our kin, we are tangled in the ecologies that made their life and their death, even if only by proxy. Witnessing as a kind of response is thus strangely reciprocal. What you give and what you get within a weave of life whose frayed fabrics further unraveling, we want to help stay. This witnessing cannot be the only response to the violence that masks itself as inevitable, but it is one response. Part four, how to grieve in cetacean time. The dead are still waiting for us to catch up. We lag beholden to other times and other measures. That's how, perhaps a bit melodramatically, I began my notes of the first necropsy. We were supposed to start at 2 a.m., but there were delays on your end. We finally got going around 2.45 and four hours after that we were done. The time gets folded up and tucked into the night, feeling the next day like either a dream or something very long ago. You tell us about the strange temporalities of the work, the manic rush to get things ready, 
that then falls into the meditative slowness of being with the animal on the table. During one of the necropsies, you confess, I had a hectic day. I'm quiet now because I'm enjoying just being with the animal. The three of us have a standing Friday meeting. Although these meetings have been going on for months, none of us can ever remember what time they're at. When are we meeting again? One of us texts our WhatsApp group. We can never keep it straight. Cetacean time becomes our emergent shorthand for the way time keeps wrinkling and stretching, folding in or slipping away. In another team meeting, we talk about the freezer as a key technology of cetacean time. One of the pathologists that Jamie talked to described the importance of freezers. Necropsy of the stranded is enabled by the proximity, availability, size, and quality of freezers. Freezers seem to be a technology of suspension and by extension, one of the modalities of cetacean time. Freezers holding cetacean time, holding it in suspense. Before you begin each necropsy, Patty has asked you to take a photo of yourself with your hand on the animal. This ritual is excessive. You don't need to do it. But as the series of necropsies rolls on through the spring, you tell me and Patty about how you have come to cherish this time in the freezer, just you and the animal, both a part of and in excess of the scientific practice. In May, you showed me an old photo you found of yourself back in the Bay of Fundy from the 1990s when you were doing porpoise rescues with the research station there. You're sitting in a boat, a rescued porpoise quickly brought aboard before it could be safely returned to the waters outside of the herring wear net where it had been stranded. Your hand rests on the back of its gray body. Deborah Bird Rose has also written about what she calls multi-species knots of ethical time. This, she says, is when intergenerational time of an animal in the form of species kinships intersects with the now of the animal, its present entanglements with non-kin species that nourish it in its lifetime. So I wonder if the freezer is a technology of cetacean time it's also a habitat for the tying of a multi-species knot, but the kind that we insist on tying, even and especially when death is all around us. Part five, caring for science and caring for scientists. Today, there are so many stranded beings who live and then die among strangers away from the places they could once call home. In the ongoing time of the COVID pandemic, we have witnessed the ways our loved ones have been forced to say their goodbyes via iPad and Zoom meeting, stranded in hospitals whose borders we could not cross. In a time of climate catastrophe, we witnessed the dying of ways of life among many plant and animal species that are stranded in bioregions whose temperatures or conditions no longer support their flourishing. We have witnessed the forced migration of millions of human bodies, uprooted by spectacular weather events like hurricanes and typhoons, but just as often by the slow climate violence of increasing drought or heat or wet. In Asia, as elsewhere, the numbers of these migrants include many people internally displaced by climate disaster but the stranded come from all over the world to seek shelter on our shores. They often do not find it. So who cares for the stranded? This is a question that rises in urgency alongside the temperatures and the sea levels. And so we return to the edge of the sea. Who cares for these animals that are washed up on our terrestrial shores away from their own kin? Given the state of our planet's oceans, care here requires a commitment to these animals' lives and to their ongoingness. Care requires a refusal to see their kind as already dead or their deaths as individuals and species as inevitable. Care requires all of these things for all of the stranded everywhere. 
In the end, a central question that our project asks is this. Might science and the scientific practice of necropsy, its unconventional intimacy, its attentive protocols, its strange suspensions in cetacean time, might this also be a form of care? This is not an obvious or simple proposition. I am a swim in all kinds of tensions of instrumentalization and objectification, theoretical abstraction and dangerous analogy, all of this chafing against the desire for beautiful poetry and a satisfying ending. Just pay attention, I have to keep reminding myself. Instead of truth, go for honesty. In one of the necropsies, I watch your palm as it rests on little girl's back. You are holding the animal, but the animal's body is also supporting you. Literally, I mean, this is just a material fact. The animal's body supports your hand because it is no longer supported by the sea and succumbing to terrestrial gravity, the animal is now stranded on your table. Holding is complicated and multivalent. The project teaches us that nothing can hold everything. We begin to understand that this kind of care requires not only the narrowing of the aperture in order to really see the animal in granular detail, but also the capacity for a concomitant pulling out to see the worlds that the animal holds and is held by or not. These worlds are mostly a tangled mess, but nor are they already dead. But as Patty also asked in one of our last meetings, who cares for the scientist? Western science is no doubt flawed, but we are also now watching all around us as science is co-opted for political gain and capitalist growth, or worse, ignored and denied altogether. Under such circumstances, what support can we extend to science and scientists in their extension of care to the stranded? Might science, when understood as care, be reconfigured? Might art, Patty suggested, be for science a form of care? 11th of June, 2021. I write in my notes, strangely with each session, these seem more like individual beings, not less. The stomach is full, it's jam-packed full of food, it means it fed just before it died, otherwise in good condition, in good health, robust, healthy, lots of fluid in the lungs. I notice how you lay your hand on the only piece of skin still intact on the animal. I think we're ready, you say, 5.29 a.m. Thanks. Thank you for the intimate and crucial um, critical space you've opened for us through this talk. Um, it's difficult and important um, to think about and contend with multi-species death under the conditions of the climate and refugee crisis, um, late stage capitalism and necropolitical colonial institutions. But in coalescing death with uh, practices of postmortem care, thing brings us all, all to the urgent space of thinking about how we mediate and show up in our present ecologies and beyond our current fields of vision. So thank you, Ms. Trita. Um, could you speak a bit more to the multivalent existence of stranded human bodies, especially our most present forms of stranding stemming from, of course, the pandemic and geonational violence and bioecological violence um, and how that's, I guess, resulted in, in new forms of stranding or new versions of older forms of stranding of human bodies. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was quite emotional for me to read that talk today. I don't know why. Um, I've given different versions of it in a couple of places, but um, today it just really uh, resonated with myself. <laughs> but I think um, the thing about this project, and this is like leading into my answer to your question, 
is what it has forced me to do is to slow down and pay attention to something that was, you know, always there. And one of, um, and I think that was really, you know, coming to me as I was reading it, I was sort of brought right back to those moments. And one of, uh, one of the unexpected uh, results of this research that we did together, Patty, Alexi, and I, which initially was supposed to be about, you know, porpoises and whales and necropsy and maybe something about water and suspension. You know, when you begin a practice-based project, you don't always know where it's going to go. But unexpectedly, this theme of stranding and its broader resonance was really brought home to us when we spoke to, um, I mean, not just us, but when our, our research collaborators, Jamie and Sue, spoke to scientists and told us of their own stranding uh, encounters. Um, it really brought home for us the theme of stranding as a very pervasive one in the world we live right now, you know, through forced migration because of war and increasingly because of climate change. Um, at the time of starting this project, I was living in Australia, which you probably know is famous for its um, devastating border policies, which keep uh, refugees and asylum seekers and migrants of all kinds uh, imprisoned, locked up under horrifying conditions. Um, these, these journeys of desperation and you know, hope that people embark on seeking shelter on someone else's shore only to not find it, you know, is um, a, a motif that came to us at many times. And of course, that's not exactly analogous to the stranded marine mammal. It is not seeking to find shelter on the beach, of course not. It is stranded there for other reasons. But um, I don't want to make a comparison or analogy. What I want to do is say, what happens when we hold all of these strandings together in one view? How can we start to make connections across species that need care in different ways, across the causes of those strandings, you know, which are connected? They are connected to you know, the terror of global capitalism and white supremacy and you know, border politics heteropatriarchal control over, you know, bodies, all of these things lead to the strandings that we are now witnessing across all kinds of species and bodies. So although that wasn't, you know, the strongest theme in the talk, um, I'm really hoping that this research can invite listeners and, and ourselves as the researchers to think more about what it means to be stranded, to think, to pay attention to those bodies that are stranded and in that paying attention, notice the connections to other strandings and think about what it means to care for the stranded and then also to care for those who care, which in this, you know, in this talk was about the scientist, but in other stranding situations will be about other kinds of carers. Yeah. Yes, and sometimes it's also hard to make um, certain distinctions between um, the human bodies that are stranded and the human bodies who also care, um, because very often you also have caregivers who are stranded in different ways from their own sort of networks and ecologies of kinship and support. Um, so I think we're, we all kind of exist in, in to some degree within the spectrum, while, of course, um, there are so many people and so many bodies that are coerced into strandings as well. Um, and that is not something that we are all compelled by. That is um, a phenomenon which is geared towards the, um, towards particular communities and to, towards particular bodies. So. Sure. I, I think you're right though. You know, I think it is, it is really um, valuable to consider that, you know, that's, you're not, it's not like you're stranded or you're not. There's this broad range and spectrum of ways in which we are stranded. And, and I think, you know, for example, COVID caregivers, nurses, uh, hospice workers, you know, who have been stranded is, is you know, it, it, in all of these cases, I think it invites us to ask the question, how and why have they been stranded and, and, and how can we support them? You know, I live in a city right now that is full of anti-vaccination protests outside of hospitals, alienating and terrorizing care workers, you know, and, and that is not the kind of support that we need to give to those who care for the stranded. Yeah. 
um, of sort of a nascent thought forming, um, kind of thinking back to, I guess, the interrelations between human and non-human stranded bodies about mourning um, death, uh, perhaps individual death, the way that you are in necropsies versus mourning extinction um, and the potential for extinction. I'm wondering if that's kind of played, uh, played a part in your thinking through this project at all. Yeah. yeah, that's a, it's really interesting. One thing that we are hoping to do in the next stage of the project is actually um, interview some of the pathologists or, or other kinds of scientists who have performed necropsies on animals that are thought to be one of the last of their species. Yeah. So um, I don't really have an answer to your question, except to say that it is something to think about and without you know, sensationalizing or dramatizing that proposition, I imagine that there is something quite profoundly um, difficult about doing that kind of care work, you know, when you know an animal will not flourish any longer, and that is the necropsy you have to perform. So the project is also interested more broadly in oceans and ocean ecologies and um, extinctions and other forms of uh, you know, damage and pollution that oceans currently face. I mean, Alexia, as a, as a wildlife pathologist, is quite interested in uh, One Health, right, and the connection between, um, you know, this theoretical framework called One Health, which looks for the connections between ecological health, you know, animal species health, human health, and, and sees how they're all interconnected, which, you know, in some ways is the scientific version of my own philosophical work, which is looking at how water is uh, a connecting force, you know, in many ways across different species and different bodies. So part of the project is to look at how that connection, whether it's through health or whether it's through other modes of care and love and intangibles, um, how that habitat for connection, the ocean is being threatened. And, you know, when the, the, that milieu is threatened then, or, you know, it, you know sort of strained and, and damaged and, you know, has to do hard work to, to, you know, continue its ongoingness. I mean, the ocean will keep going. It's really just like in what form and with what capacity to hold other life. Um, you know, looking at those, that damage to the ocean then is also about looking at the ocean's capacity to continue to be a milieu of connection and care. So that's, you know, another broader frame that, that this work is interested in. Mm. I'm also thinking through here, um, I mean, when you talk about the ocean as this holding space, but also this milieu um, and coming back to this, the, the realm of the cetaceans. And I'm also thinking about what we lose when we lose those that we can't necessarily perceive or see. Um, so perhaps I'm thinking over here of like oceanic diatoms or algae, or I guess forms of life and species that are ontologically more distanced from, from the human, uh, from the mammalian species, um, if we can say, say that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's quite interesting. Uh, another recurrent theme in our research was uh, you know how elusive these animals are, mm -hmm. and one thing that Alexia kept mentioning to us was that, you know, in necropsy is one of the only instances that humans can be intimate with, you know, an ocean species mm -hmm. such as a cetacean, right? You know, of course, save those who go and pay oodles of dollars to yeah. swim with the dolphins, um, you know, uh, or sea world. That, yeah, For sure. Yeah. <laughs> the world, exactly. Um, you know, this, this in death is one of the only times that the animal reveals not only itself to us humans, but reveals its world. You know, it's like we kept thinking about how in going inside the animal in death is how the animal's whole world is opened up and revealed through these various indices, you know, like what's in its stomach and what it died from and what its health was. That's all of a sudden the glimpse into its world, which is quite profound and, and quite a privilege, right? It's, um, it's such a privilege. So in many ways, without overstating it, I mean, I, I really came to feel about this, this practice as something really quite sacred, right? Um, and, and don't get me wrong, no scientist 
would probably describe it that way, um, you know, which is another whole theme. But um, uh, this really sacred moment of having this intimacy with an animal, you're right, that otherwise remains out of view, remains elusive, um, yet whose world is so connected to ours, you know, both ecologically, you know, if the oceans give it up, you know, we don't stand a chance. So um, uh, that sort of reliance we have, that interdependence with the invisible world that um, this project sort of gave us a moment to think about. Mm. Well, perhaps not, well, sacred, but definitely ritualistic. That's, that's the feeling I got from this. Sure. Very I mean, ritual for sure. And yeah. ritual is, you know, ritual is another word for protocol. And protocol mm -hmm. is what, you know, scientists engage in. And, and, you know, Alexi explained how important it was that there is a very methodical protocol because that's the only way that you don't miss something, right? And that you keep mm -hmm. your attention trained and you, you, get, you do justice to the animal, and you give respect to the animal by methodically following the protocol, right? But one thing that, you know, was quite interesting was, um, you know, for Alexia, she mentioned that the, you know, without wanting to speak for her, um, I mean, I've heard her talk about how the project really gave her a different insight into her own work, right? That she hadn't really thought of or conceived of her work as a care practice, right? Mm. Yet in us reading back our notes, you know, of the necropsies to her and describing what we were seeing and feeling to her, she really, um, it get, you know, she said it just really gave her a whole different perspective on the work that she did and was really quite, a, you know, she described it as a beautiful gift, which is um, really lovely. Yeah, I don't think you very often have um, I guess the kind of witnesses that you and Patty, uh, well, the positions that you occupied within this work, but also in the very field and the teaching and the and the I guess the protocols of scientific education in and of itself don't really allow for these modes of thinking for those who are learning and who are growing within this discipline. Right? I mean, the heteropatriarchal pathologizing of stranded bodies of not human and human bodies, kind of take on this veneer of the objective and the rational and, you know, the logical, which also govern the deterministic and insular modes of knowledge production, um, especially within the realms of anthrop anthropology and environmental thought. So, no, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, while for me, you know, as a, somebody who in part, you know, reads and is familiar with, you know, uh, STS or science and technology studies literatures, that are very critical of, you know, Western extractive and objectifying science, I have to say that I was a bit apprehensive going into this project. I didn't want to be in the position to have to be critical of this practice that Alexia, who is also my sister, you know, right. um, is conducting. And it was also very enlightening for me. It asked me to rethink science, you know, and rethink what Western science is. And maybe it's not so much, you know, that, the, the, you know, it, what I want to say is it brought, it brought forth that big gap between what we sort of uh, hold as an imaginary of Western science and what it should be and what the actual labor and practice of it often is, right? And so when Patty and I asked Alexia, so is, for example, is the touching ritual, is that outside of your science scientific practice? Yeah. And although it kind of was, Alexia was very reluctant to say that because she wants it to be part of the science, right? Like, can we reconceive science and Western science in this case, particularly to also be inclusive of care practice, inclusive of ritual time-taking and attention giving and respect, you know, like why shouldn't those also be part of the scientific practice? So instead of saying we're doing this extra thing, it's about the scientific practice being understood more capaciously, both by those of us who might critique it and also those who are practicing it. Yeah. I mean, as you said, no science is innocent or value free. Where does that leave us? Mm -hmm. um, well, where has this left you in terms of thinking among academic, um, artistic and scientific disciplines being making as enmeshed, mutually nurturing practices? Mm. 
where has it left me? Um, I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to have done this work. I think um, similar to what I just mentioned about asking me to rethink my understanding of Western science, which, you know, in a undergraduate classroom, I might be quick to throw off a few quick, you know, critiques of. Um, I think it's taught me what I think everybody needs to think more about now is how to extend more generosity and curiosity towards things we think we are in opposition to, mm-hmm. you know, to be uh, gracious and open and willing to, to learn be willing to, you know, hear others and, and be honest about what it is that we see, you know, at one point in the talk, I give this line about, you know, instead of truth, go for honesty. And if I may just indulge a little bit more on that, you know, I think there are many truths that we can, we can affirm and we can prove and we can point to and say, see, I'm right. See, I'm right. You know, whereas honesty for me is about being very uh, um, open to the actual full bodied Mm. feeling and revelation of what is in front of us. So I can truthfully critique Western scientific practice in all sorts of ways. But when I'm honestly there in the room, not in the room, in front of my computer, watching the live stream in the middle of the night, I have to be honest about what what that is making me feel. And so that in a way is like an embodied knowledge that challenges the truths we hold dear, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, to pull out the aperture again and think about where we are right now with anti-vaxxers and climate deniers and, you know, border politics and religious fundamentalisms, you know, and all of us in our echo chambers of information, listening to and speaking to those who, with whom we agree, mm-hmm. you know, what would it mean to open up a bit and be a bit more generous to finding ways to still hear and care across difference? Not easy, not always welcome, fair, you know, sometimes that work is very violent work and can be very injuring work, mm. but um the answer cannot be to just shut ourselves off entirely from one another across species, geographies, you know, everything. And I think that sort of gesture towards openness is, um, is one thing I would like to hold on to. Yeah. I mean, porosity um, has certainly, well, your notions of porosity and our shared notions of porosity have definitely shaped the way that I've come to think about bodies and art and water. Um, but just to kind of go back to something that you were saying in terms of the embodied um, sense of honesty, like what does honesty really look like in terms of bearing witness, in terms of writing, in terms of also what um, an overall project, how it's modulated and, and changed by different moments of honesty um, across space, time. I mean, kinships play out in these really beautiful, strange, sometimes sad ways across the human and non-human, um, even within the stock, within the scope of the stock. Uh, you have this very intimate sensorial phenomenological difference, you know, between um, sort of the, the hands of the pathologist performing the necropsy, and then you have the non-human body, you have the cetacean body, and then you have you and Patty in, the, in this digitally, geologically distanced, removed space, um, but within a, a completely different flow, um, I guess, uh, w- within this assemblage. And yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak more to this, this matrix that you develop. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure, to like pick up on that theme of honesty. Like when we first proposed the work, we had hoped that we would be able to be in person, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps travel to Sweden, watch Alexia do a necropsy or two in her lab you know, take that home as, you know, a scholar of embodiment and as a practitioner of embodiment, which we all are, but, you know, I particularly joyously revel in it. Um, You know, I was quite disappointed when, you know, it became increasingly clear that this work would have to be done mediated through computer screens again, like you and I, right, right now. Um, But again, I was surprised. I was surprised by the un, un, 
the unanticipated intimacy mm. that the work afforded us. And I think it, it was the time difference that helped. You know, I live in a home with three children and a partner and two cats. And, you know, trying to yeah. do that at three in the afternoon would have been ridiculous. Mm. Uh, but doing it at 2 a.m. in the dark, mm. just, you know, the small glow of the computer screen, uh, Patty and I periodically oh. nodding off and falling asleep and, you know, watching the light slowly mm. rise behind us. It was a really intimate kind of relation mm. that, again, was possible because we were open to it, you know. And I think, again, if these times teach us something, it's, you know, this, this need to be responsive to what is there and to remain open to what is there instead of, you know, canceling the project and say, we can't do it. We tried something else, you know, as any artists listening or people like yourself, you know, who are very much uh, uh, living and breathing art all the time, you know, this kind of this openness to sort of respond to the materiality of the situation, to experiment, to not predetermine what will come out at the other end is a skill that everybody needs more right now. Um, as somebody trained in more academic fields where there's an expectation of, you know, hypothesis and sort of, you know, or research plan that you follow through mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, we, we're all throwing up our hands now and saying, you can't make plans like that right now, whether it's COVID or whether it's climate change or, you know, the bushfires that raged around this city all summer or who knows what it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how instead do we learn to be responsive and responsible mm -hmm. to what is in front of us, Um that's a very sort of extrapolating answer to your question. But uh, the, the, this matrix that evolved in the project was um, unanticipated, unplanned, but one that we are all very grateful to have had the opportunity to mm. work with. Yeah, this is, this is the question, isn't it? I mean, we're working incredibly remotely with most international artists right now, as most sort of festivals and art biennales have. And... Um, yeah, it's curious to me how we're still creating portals through art, um, despite all of these different yeah, matrices of working, of co-production, of collaboration, of knowledge exchange, of um, cessation also, you know, giving up. What is, what is giving over control really even look like? What is giving up authorship in the ways that we've known it um, also look like? Um, within the artistic world, right? And art still kind of becoming this portal of care. I mean, that's been quite crucial to the Sea Art Festival, how um, each of the artworks can become the sort of liquid, porous portal to care, grief, joy, uncanniness, you know, frictions among different bodies, human, non-human, watery, stranded. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if, tying it back to, I guess, your book, um, Bodies of Water, uh, where where has that thought, where has that realm of thinking developed for you through this project and with these wider interrelations? Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, one thing I have come to realize um, in the years since publishing Bodies of Water, which I don't think I said in the book or not mm. in so many words, um, is that for me, like water is a teacher of methodology more than an object of study, right? So, you know, to have spent so much time paying attention to water and watery beings and watery ecologies, again, has taught me a different way of being in the world, right? A different way that is, I mean, not that I perfectly enact this by any means, you know, but an, at least an aspiration towards more porosity and more connection and more relation, more attention to what I'm sucking up and what I'm Spelling. pouring back out of myself. Um, it's been like a, a deeply ethical uh, schooling, to be fr quite frank, you know, to pay attention to water and to really take that seriously, you know, um, 
And I suppose that is a sort of method and an ethics that also travels through this project, right? This, um, this openness to, uh, you know, learning and, and uh, a resistance to being extractive mm. to the extent that we can. It's very difficult um, to a real attention to, um, you know, pouring out again. Like, look, water is the ultimate teacher for collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. To think about how to engage collaboration carefully mm -hmm. and um, respectfully, being open to changing yourself, but also, you know, you don't want to be washed away altogether. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the, the thinking with water and the bodies of water work mostly it stays with me as a method. Although, of course, I'm still interested in watery places and watery bodies and watery subjects as sites, you know, as sort of like a multi-sided, continuous, curious investigation of the world, of the watery world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so lucky I, <laughs> I decided on water 15 years ago because I will never, you know, run out of things to be curious about. Um, You've tapped into the ultimate yeah, cycle, truly. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think I think we're very much running out of time. But um, thank you so much for being here. Um, truly appreciate uh, holding the space with you and uh, kind of existing in it in these gestational, porous ways, but still kind of holding our own tethers. Um, to what needs to be done, um, what needs to be worked on. And yeah. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much for your really generous questions and your um, like very deep engagement with the work. It's a real gift to me. And it's been such a pleasure to talk with you as the sun sets behind me, as I'm sure it's you know slowly cresting up where you are. And even across these oceans, we have found this space of intimacy and connection. So thank you.